Welcome to Abstraction Through Simplification. Simply rolls off the tongue. All right, simplification is a constant in design. You've seen it a lot already. We basically want to get our point across quickly and powerfully. Simplification and stylation are methods of abstraction. We distill reality down to its most essential parts. In design and art, abstraction is the modification of representational forms. So we reduce a shape to a more simple shape, but we still maintain the connection to the actual thing. In other words, we change it from what it was into something simpler, but we still know what it is. When we abstract, we begin with something and move away from it, yet remain connected to it. Through simplification, we move away from the literal and toward the abstract. Think of it as a means of deliberately altering or manipulating the shapes and forms for a specific purpose. It's based in reality, but it doesn't directly represent reality. As a design approach, abstraction allows us to focus on the various shapes, the shape relationships, colors, lines, directions, rhythms, all that that make up the design. Not get bogged down in the photographic details like we're so accustomed to. Remember way back messed that up. Remember way back, I'll start again, to what we talked about Gestalt last week, uh, how the brain wants to work as, I shouldn't say it that way, it makes it sound very lazy. The brain wants to reduce reality to its simplest form, the simplest form possible. And the simplest in this case is two shapes rather than three shapes. That's yet another rationale for why we like uh, abstraction through simplification when we're working in design. And this is an unknown transition. It was brilliant. And we're back to the next step, which is talking about um, why abstraction is often the best vehicle for communicating an idea or concept. Why is that the case, you might ask? Well, or I may ask. Um, first of all, it makes it more interesting, I think. Direct representation, just like a, a realistic drawing of a bear can seem too rote or too familiar. Uh, and it often just shows off the artist's rendering skills. And the deliberate use of abstraction just can be more um, original, more engaging. That's one reason. It also helps to unify the design. This is a logo for, I don't actually know who it's for, but um, not only do we have the shape, the three shapes on the left are create a profile, which does relate to the organization, which I probably should have on here. But what I'm getting at is the repetition of those shapes holds it together as a unit. And that's something you can't do in photography or realistic artwork. You get caught up in what the feathers look like or what the, beak, the shape of the beak. And th this is a way to say more. Also it helps create a mood. By manipulating shapes and modulating the color, you can suggest a mood and an ambiance. You can use a cool palette, um, or in this case, a warm palette and round shapes to convey a happy mood and happy upbeat ambiance. Also helps communicate ideas or concepts better. You can even combine two or more unrelated objects into a new form for sometimes startling effects. Here we see the Hope for Africa Children Initiative, and I did not see the profiles when I first looked at this. I just saw the country, um, but that's you know harder to do with being uh, realistic and literal and complex. Another reason is historically, it's not so much the case these days, um, simply executed objects were easier to produce, to print. Modern printing has made that much less the case, but it's still fairly true for silk screening. If you can imagine going to the Olympics and every sign that you see of, you know, um, telling you where to go or on the restroom or anywhere, um, it's going to be easier to read and easier for them to produce if it's simpler. It's also the universal appeal. Um, science has proven that we absorb visuals more readily than we do text, in part because the brain wants to do less, but the quicker it registers an object, the longer it retains the information, actually. Um, it's part of why symbols have such a universal appeal. Appeal. So like I said, upheaval. So how do we simplify? This is Picasso, that old hack. The process of abstraction compels us to, first of all, observe and analyze what we see. We pay close attention to how something is formed and how we can reform it, reform it 
to our own purposes. Basically, take it apart and put it back together again, which is one of the things that the cubists actually did do. You want to develop an awareness of how basic shapes are at work in the forms you're drawing. Overall, um, or rather, observe the overall shape of the total form. You can see this exercise, and you're going to, I think you're going to be doing something like this. You start with a realistic drawing of this locker, and then it gets more abstract as it goes along. So it just becomes more about the shapes and how the shapes interact. Notice how the eye distinguishes various parts of the object and how the light falling on the object helps us understand the shapes within. The, some, some of these without a light source, for example, the second two rows of here wouldn't really work. We need the light source in order for, to see those shapes. So abstraction through simplification helps us focus attention on the essential qualities of an object. This person's study for uh, this lion head, you can see the different stages of at the very top left. I'd say it's probably the most realistic of what they're showing here. And I would say the one directly below it is probably the most abstract, or perhaps the one with the lines right in the center. But went through various stages and trying to see how far they can push it. What shapes are the necessary visual cues for your object? Some parts of the object are more important to identifying what it is than other ones are. What to retain, what to toss. Paying attention to the various parts, the relationships within the design space, and how everything comes together to express the final whole design. How far can you go and still recognize the object? Here's an example I found of a simplified drawing of a polar bear mother and cub. First thing the designer does is take it sub their subject matter and create their narrative. In this case, the interaction of the, the mother and child or the mother and cub. Uh, and then, well, how to render it. They chose a an abstracted, although simplified, uh, approach here. Um, and you can see, uh, it's very geometric. There's a repetition of shapes. They've reduced the polar bear down to its most essential qualities. Um, in the last one, you can see where they've they've had the, the coloration to separate the the mother and the child, which I don't I don't think that's absolutely necessary, and it's probably not always done that way. But um, that's minor. But I think. Um, it's, it's a great example of taking something very complex and reducing it to something very simple, but still uh, that simple object has an emotional impact. So we saw the shapes repeated in the polo there. Um, a good design is based on the relationship of shapes. Repeating and relating the shapes to one another is a way of uniforming, I'm sorry, unifying different forms within the design. Now, implied shapes are worth noting. Abstraction using line and shape combines closed shapes, just meaning that a square, let's say closed on four sides, with shapes implied through the use of lines. That means basically a shape that's not closed, that might have be closed on three sides, like we see the top of the phone here. Initially, one might, when I say one might, uh, a, a younger person or a, someone who's new to design or drawing might outline like a coloring book or fill in the shape with a color or a pattern, like the, the first and second. On the far right, we see an implied shape. You notice how the central shape is not completely outlined, and yet we still know what it is. And why is that? Remember back to a few weeks ago, we talked about the Gestalt rule of closure? Well, that's why. The Gestalt principle allows the viewer, or describes how our minds work, that we uh, mentally complete the shape even if the lines are not there. And why do we do this? Why not just complete the shape? Implied, not fully clothed, clothed, fully enclosed shapes allows for a better integration of the positive and negative spaces, of negative shapes within the composition. I will try to say that again. Implied, not fully enclosed shapes allows for a better integration of the positive and negative shapes within a composition. It's just more dynamic. It's it, it simply it's just it's just more interesting. The viewer is invited in to complete the image. It's almost interactive in a way. Here we have several different line weights um, contrasting with the various shapes, mostly of black. Although one could argue there's lots of white shapes there too, uh, and they create an integrated composition that exhibits both unity and variety, which is what you want. You want unity to hold it together. You want variety to make it interesting. 
Um, I already sh showed you that earlier Swan example, but here's two other ones that use uh, logos that use implied lines. Now, when a design um, includes too ma many elements, like the one on the right, and I forgive me for the bad photograph, um, but I think you kind of will get the point here, um, that there's too many elements that are too different from one another, we no longer can really see the overall organizing pattern. We start losing what that checkerboard is um, on the right. It's on the left that we do see that organizing pattern and that it holds together. Again, it's almost like I'm trying to prove my point by giving you a terrible photograph, but I'm not. Um, the re resulting design on the left is uncomfortable and seems chaotic and difficult to, we say read, to read it as an object. It tends to overwhelm us and it becomes visually static. Um, while there is indeed a decent amount of detail on the right, there is also a heavy reliance on the repeated elements. So the eye basically has less new information to take in. It already knows what a tall black rectangular shape is and with little white squares on it. So it can repeat that and the brain's like, oh yeah, I already know what that is. It's like, it's like going to the Amazon site and you know where everything is and you just click, click, click through because because there's a familiarity with how they do things, how the visuals, and that's not by accident. We'll get to that some other time. Um, so some tools as designers that we can use to add a level of interest and complexity, or I could say visual interest without adding unnecessary complexity, put it that way, are repetition, scale, and rotation. So in this example, you have the same, the same leaf or pretty close to the same leaf, pretty close to the same leaf. It has to be slightly different. That'd be amazing otherwise. So the same shape basically is repeated three times and rotated around in a circle. And we've now created this dual image, positive and negative, wonderful thing with leaves and the bird in the middle. Um, and we can take it all in because we're not reinterpreting every one of those leaves. We just, we, we see one of them, we know what the other two are, are the same thing, and we just get it. Um, so you can create a more complex design if you're using a unified group of shapes or lines. It just holds together. A good example of repeated shapes and lines, and this is completely symmetrical. So if you uh, cut that bull down the center, it's completely a mirror image. So that's, first of all, all those lines are repeated the other way. Um, you look deeper, you can see that the same curved line that's used over and over again. For example, the line of the mouth and the snout is parallel or the parallel to each other, the two snouts. Um, and almost the, the mirror opposite of the lines that are in the forehead. Like the checkerboard pattern I showed you, this illustration is limiting the amount of new information that the reader has to digest. And what we interpret is just an overall visual harmony. You also don't, I mean, the other thing you see here is line weight. Most of it is pretty much the same weight. The lines that come down from the side of the nose are thicker, but those are almost shapes. But the dark line that goes around the horns, the ears, and goes all around the edges is the same weight. That's another thing you don't want to do. Like if you're an illustrator, use five different line weights within the same small drawing. It just becomes too much for the person to look at. And our last slide, simplification, repetition, line, shape, foreground, background, basically always ask yourself, how much do we, the viewer, need to know in order to tell what that is? And I always feel like design is, in almost all cases, but especially here when you're doing abstraction through simplification, is a tug of war between saying the most by using the least. Um, and sometimes you go too far, you'll take too much out and you have to add stuff back. Sometimes it's still too complex and there's more things you could take off. Um, and that's part of the fun. And with that, I will say, go do the quiz. Um, this is a newer recording of this. The, uh, this is shorter and so much better than the old one. Lucky you. Uh, and that's all. See you in class.